Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 45 with freediver, chef, speaker, and huntress, Kimmy Werner. This episode was brought to you by Olakai, a company who puts a ton of time and thought into crafting amazing footwear for men and women. I have a ton of pairs of Olakai sandals and even some of their slip-ons, and I love their shoes because they're all made really well so they don't break down, and they're all stylish so you can wear them with really nice outfits and always to the beach. Olakai was founded to celebrate the Aloha spirit and the waterman lifestyle, and they also aim to do a lot of good. They believe that sustainability and positive living is less about an ethos and more about the choices and actions you make every day. One of the best parts is this company is a certified B Corporation, and they do a ton of giving back to communities. They even have their own Ama Olukai Foundation, a nonprofit that helps to preserve the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian spirit, which I'm a big fan of considering my grandma lived in the islands. You can check them out and buy an awesome pair of sandals or even some slip-ons or one of their new pairs of boots for yourself or a loved one this season at olukai.com. That's O-L-U-K-A-I, olukai.com. This episode was brought to you by Traeger Grills. Even if you're a veg head like me, wood-fired grills just make food taste better than charcoal or gas. It's kind of like how food tastes better when you camp. They have a six-in-one versatility, so you can cook hot and fast or low and slow, allowing you to grill, smoke, bake, roast, braise, and barbecue with one device. Plus, they have digital control, so they're super easy to use, and you can set consistent temperatures and master whatever recipe you're working on. Plus, if you're barbecuing for friends and family, you get to focus on what matters most, which is hanging out and having fun rather than worrying about perfecting or maybe burning your food. This is the grill used by world-class chefs, barbecue masters, and even badass explorers like Kimmy Warner, a guest of this show. You can go to TraegerGrills.com to check them out. They make awesome holiday gifts. That's T-R-A-E-G-E-R Grills.com. Kimmy Werner is a force of nature. If you've ever seen the video or even the image of the beautiful woman freediving with a 17-foot great white shark and gracefully holding onto its dorsal fin, that's Kimmy Werner. Growing up off the grid in Maui, Kimmy learned to freedive with her father at a young age, and although she gave it up for years, when she rediscovered it, she went on to become the U.S. National Spearfishing Champion, a certified culinary chef, an award-winning artist, and a sought-after speaker. She's also an environmental advocate, and her path wasn't always linear. This is easily my new favorite episode because... We talk about how to make a living from your passions, especially one that's pretty wild. We also discuss what it's like to be in a field dominated by men and why it's important to speak up no matter who you are when asking for what you want, even if it's a raise. We also discuss how you can live more wildly now, where you can learn to practice breath holding, why saying no can be so powerful, trusting your gut, and what it means when she says to speed up you have to slow down. I hope you enjoy this show. All right, today we have on Kimmy Warner, one of the most amazing athletes, freediver, huntress, chef. You have so many talents behind your name, Kimmy. So excited to have you on Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thank you for coming on. Thanks. Thanks so much, Shelby. I really appreciate that, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. And you're calling from where? Where are you right now? I am home on the North Shore of Oahu. I was born on the island of Maui, but um, I've been living on Oahu for quite some time now. And it's really nice to to be here in Hawaii. 
Yeah, you live in a beautiful place. My gram actually lived in Waikiki until she died, laying out in a bikini, Mai Tai in one hand, Siggy in the other, <laughs> a guy maybe 20 years younger by her side. But I loved visiting oh, her in Hawaii. God. What a great place. So, oh, your grandma's my hero. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> she was pretty badass. So, Kimmy, I love in, in your TED Talk you gave at TED Maui where you said to speed up, you have to slow down. I'd love for you to tell us kind of what that means to you and then how everyday people can use that to apply that message to life. Sure. Um, So yeah, my, my little Ted talk was called when you feel the need to speed up, slow down. And that was just literal advice that was once given to me about free diving Um, because in free diving, a lot of times we tend to start to rush and swim really fast because we're afraid of running out of oxygen, but that's the worst thing you can do. And, and so that advice really proved to be true that the more that, you know, anytime I would get panic or get scared and just feel like, Oh, I'm running out of air. I should, I should speed up. That became my true indicator to slow down and to take a moment. And whenever I would, I would have so much more time underwater and I'd be able to make better decisions. So I started applying that same advice to my life above water. And I guess the most monumental time where it really came in handy um, was after I had this experience with a great white shark. And it was just a sacred and beautiful experience caught on film where a great white shark, you know, approached me unexpectedly in the water but through using body language and through using everything that I've learned from my years in the ocean, we were able to have just this beautiful, peaceful interaction where I even, she even let me just, you know, touch her and hold on and go for a ride on her. And it really was one of those moments where I learned a lot because it was really the scariest moment of my life turned into the most beautiful. And It got me thinking to just, you know, how we operate in this society and how oftentimes we feel this pressure on us telling us that we have to get somewhere faster, you know, whether it's our career or whatever it is. And and this pressure makes us panic. It makes us do things that we think we're supposed to be doing, but it doesn't always help us get anywhere. And and the more that I thought about that, I realized that, you know, when you feel that pressure, when you feel that need to speed up or to panic in any department of life, a lot of times one of the best things you can do is just give yourself a moment, slow down, tune in with yourself and see if there's a better decision you can make. That's such good advice. But but I I just, if I saw a great white shark, I just would panic and there's just no. That, That is exactly my point, you know, is that, if you were to kind of listen to your fear or maybe even just listen to, you know, what, what the world has taught you, you know, from what you watch in movies and whatnot, your natural reaction, if you saw a great white shark would be to scream shark, probably try and frantically splash your way back to the boat, you know, and just turn and swim the other way. But if you, if you really just kind of give yourself a moment to consider that plan, it's really not a good one. Number one, you can never outswim a great white shark. I guarantee you that. So that's not going to get you anywhere good. And so for me, the more that, you know, I, I think that I didn't really have a chance to reflect or anything like that or to give actual thought to it. But I think everything that I had learned in the ocean just taught me that that's not what I want to do. And so instead, what I did is I swam towards that shark. I did the opposite of what you would think you're supposed to do. But in doing that, she instantly changed her energy. You know, she she was kind of coming in hot. And by the time I saw her, she was right in my face, like swimming straight at me. But the moment I just turned and swam towards her, she veered off. And she didn't leave, but her whole body language changed. She just started swimming in this slow, mellow way. And every time she'd get curious about me, she'd swim up towards me. And I just knew that it's my duty to swim down towards her. And by doing this, what, you know, I was conveying that um, I'm, I'm like her. I'm another predator. I'm not afraid of her. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to try and 
swim away from her out of fear. I am just another predator. And so anytime she was curious about me, I made sure to show just as much curiosity in her. Oh, and it's the most beautiful picture video I've ever seen. For those of you listening, <laughs> we'll put it on the show notes or you'll, you'll see the picture probably in the album cover. It's Kimmy just gracefully swimming, swimming, her hand extended on the dorsal fin of a great white shark. That was how, how big was it about? Um, it was 17 feet long, <laughs> about 17 feet long. <laughs> and, and I want to know how, you know, one of the most interesting things about you is it does seem from an outsider's point of view that after that experience with a shark and the video went viral, which I think it's really cool. We talk about this. We're going to talk about this later, how you decided not to release that footage to Hollywood. You kind of kept it to yourself. But what I think is so interesting is from an outsider's point of view, it almost seems like your career exploded after that, but it hadn't, you'd been building it. And one of the things that you do is, is you've been able to combine your loves of cooking, spearfishing and storytelling into your career. Could you just tell us like how you figured out how to do that and you know, did you ever feel like you were chasing a bunch of loose ends or, or was this all, my guess is it was all pretty calculated in some ways. You know, it was, it was calculated in a very intuitive way. I think I, I always felt like I was chasing loose ends to a certain degree, but at the same time, there was a deeper part of myself just still not letting go of these things that I really enjoyed. And uh, you're right, like cooking, um, you know, expressing myself, storytelling, all of that, um, they were passions of mine. And, and to be able to combine them into spearfishing, I mean, that, that's a dream come true for me. And it, it's not a dream that I ever really knew in my heart, like absolutely knew could be a reality. But I still felt a pull towards it. And I would say it was just many years in the making of simply following my passion. And maybe a big part of it was not exactly knowing whether or not everything would work out and turn into success, but still knowing that even without that, it was worth it to try. It was worth it to immerse myself into these things that I love. Ah, And maybe you could briefly tell me how you got to love spearfishing. You know, I, I'd read and heard on a video, uh, there's a great video, Fish People, put out by Patagonia, that talks about your love of spearfishing started when you were a kid from your father. It did. It started at the age of five. Um, I grew up on the island of Maui and in this little town called Haiku. And at the time, my parents really did not have very much money at all. And They worked really hard, but they still needed to put food on the table at the end of the day. And they depended on the land and the ocean around us to help do that. So my dad would do spearfishing and food diving to go get dinner and to feed us. And the amazing thing is that I never did feel poor during those days. Like we were eating lobster and fresh fish and at the age of five, my dad actually let me start coming with him in the ocean on his side. And that was when it just felt like he turned my world into absolute magic. I mean, just just being in that world with him and, you know, I wouldn't spear fish. I was much too young, but I would be able to put in my orders, my favorite dinners, watch my dad disappear into the depths and return to me with a fresh cast in hand. And that is what gave me my absolute appreciation for spearfishing and free diving. I love that. And then you returned to it later in life. I did. I did. I mean, we, that, that was basically a short, a short period of my life where I got to do those things with my dad. Um, in a few years after that, he did start making money and his company actually took off and started doing really well. And our lives changed dramatically. We moved to a subdivision and we no longer, you know, spent as much time in the ocean because we didn't have to gather this food and because my parents were now so busy with their new careers. And so I felt a genuine loss. Even though I knew what we were doing was progress, I did feel a loss. And, and that loss kind of followed me throughout my whole life where even when I was 24 years old, 
living on a completely different island, graduated from college with a career. I still just felt these memories, these these just golden childhood memories calling me back, you know, and after a whole lifetime of experiencing that, I just thought I have to see what this is about. And because for the longest time, I had just written it off as nostalgia, as something that everybody must feel. And I even looked up the definition of nostalgia and it said, um, longing for something that no longer exists. And so that's kind of what I wrote it off to be. But finally, at the age of 24, I really started questioning that and saying, does it have to be that way where it no longer exists? You know, maybe that lifestyle I crave, maybe those memories that haunt me, maybe they are something that I can recreate in my own life in this modern world. And that was when I set out to see if I could and just got a spear and decided to enter the ocean on my own. So what happened? The first time you entered the ocean? Uh, well, I was freaked out. That's for sure. I mean, so I had my fear. I had a mask and fins, but I just then became totally overwhelmed with the fear and the feeling that I had no idea what I was doing and that I was an idiot. You know, I mean, really, that's how I felt. I remember walking with my fear and my mask and fins across the beach and kind of passing people as I headed towards the ocean. And I remember just like the voices in my head were just like, you know, who do you think you are? And what do you think you're doing? And you're embarrassing yourself. And just, you know, all these mean self-criticizing voices telling me that I shouldn't be doing it. And as I slipped into the water, they didn't go away. I was even more freaked out. Um, you know, just not knowing exactly which direction to swim in, not knowing where to find fish and not even being able to see 360 degrees around me to see if there were any other creatures lurking near. Um, everything was getting to me, but the secret that I used to calm down that day was I just imagined, I just visualized my dad's silhouette off in the distance. And as soon as I could make myself see that, I felt this calm come over me because that's how it was when I was a kid. You know, I'd be scared as a kid, but I believed in my dad so much that whenever I look at him and I see him, I would know that I was safe. And so I kind of just imagined him there and I let him guide me in my mind. And I did end up finding this reef and, um, and, and recognizing the fish that my dad used to hunt for. And I went down and tried again and again and again. And eventually I was able to just get a few fish, you know, and not, not any big trophy catches, but just a few humble fry fish off of the reef that I was able to take home that night and cook for myself. And I just remember that the woman that walked out of the ocean that day was a completely different being than the one that walked in. Because when I walked out of that ocean, I felt proud of myself. And I felt this sense of primal satisfaction that I had never felt to that degree. And it didn't matter, you know, if my cat was no pro with no trophy prize or anything like that. It was food that I went out and got for myself. And I just felt like a glowing lioness and to take those fish home and clean them with my own two hands and be able to cook them and share them with my roommate. That added such quality to my life that, you know, it, it's never been the same since. That is so awesome. I want to go out right now and go spear fishing with you. <laughs> so, Tell me also about your beliefs in magic. I, I've heard you believe in magic. Just so you know, I talked to Liz Clark, the sailor, and I talked to Devin Bisson, <laughs> the filmmaker, who gave me a lot of insight. Devin gave me insight to one of the first questions I asked you. Um, and they wanted me to talk to you about this. But but I'm also a believer in a little magic. Um, I've had a lot of guests who are very successful who believe in magic. And maybe you can talk to me about magic as it relates um, kind of briefly t to the last trip you took, um, I know you, you found a note from a friend who passed away with the names of three islands on it, and then you went. Maybe talk to me about that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I would have to actually say that, first of all, I'm, I am a believer that magic is something we make. You know, I don't necessarily really think of it as this like magical pixie dust that somehow gets sprinkled on certain ones of us and certain parts of our life. I think that it's something that's within us that 
we can all tap into. And by truly listening to your innermost being and following that, you can experience forms of, of bliss and specialness that are just so wonderful that there probably is no better word than magic. Um, but I do think it's something that we create that's inside of us. But I think the more we spend time doing it, the more it knows how to find us and the more unexpected gifts of miracles will just come and fall in our laps. The more that we open up our channels to receive it, I do totally believe that it just starts pouring in. (laughs) Um, And yeah, my most recent trip was a very, very special one. Um, I went to a place called the Azores and The Azores are a group of nine beautiful islands um, off of the coast of Portugal. And I mean, they're, they're far off the coast of Portugal. They're not right there. They're, they're like Hawaii. They're, they're a group of islands in the middle of the ocean, except they're in the Atlantic. And I had never heard of them before, but I had this, this very, very wonderful friend, you know, practically my whole life, this girl named Tani. I met her when I was eight years old and, um, you know, I just, I don't have much of a better word for her than, than a sister or a soulmate. Like I just, I believe that soulmates aren't always like, you know, romantic partners. I think that soulmates can come in many forms. And unfortunately six years ago, um, you know, when, when we were both 31 years old, she passed away in, in a tragic car accident. And, and that was just, that was just extremely hard for me. You know, I think also because I had so many expectations of her being there my whole life. She's just somebody where when I thought about maybe one day getting married, I saw her, she'd be there at the wedding. When I thought about, you know, possibly having kids, she'd be an auntie to these kids. And and she's just somebody who there was no doubt in my heart that we would grow old together being the best of friends. And so... So saying, saying goodbye to Tani in the physical world was something that was really painful to me. And, um, and six years ago, after she passed away, um, I had flown back to Maui to help clean out her room. And, you know, I, and as I was just going through her stuff and looking at her belongings, I ended up finding this crumpled up piece of paper in a drawer, in a drawer of her dresser. And, um, and on this piece of paper, there were some questions that Tani had written down and asked herself and she answered them. And one of the questions, you know, asked her like whose lifestyle, um, you know, she, she'd want to, she'd want to like whose lifestyle she looked up to the most where she would want a lifestyle like that. And, and her answer was said, Kimmy. And that alone just kind of broke my heart. I think just to see even this, my name written in her little handwriting was just made me miss her even more. And then the next question said, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? And, and she wrote the Azores and I had no idea where that was. And, um, but yeah, I saw that piece of paper and it just kind of broke my heart. Um, because I saw that she had some dreams that were still unfulfilled, you know, in this world and knowing that she was no longer here physically, um, that just made me feel very motivated to do what I could to fulfill those. You know, I just know that I was going to spend the rest of my life missing her. And, um, and I just wanted her to have anything that she had wanted. And so I just promised myself, um, one day I'm going to go there. And I, I went home and I, I Googled the Azores, I researched it and I just ended up seeing, gosh, these beautiful islands that were just, so insanely oh sorry these beautiful islands that were just so insanely gorgeous that I had never heard of and I just knew one day I'll be there um and so I actually just got back from there and um and I have to say it was one of the best trips I've ever taken and um I'm just so grateful that I got to do that I'm so grateful that Tani led me to that special place because the trip I had there was just so amazing and just so good, good for me. I mean, these islands are amazing. They're just these tannic lava rock islands with lush green plants growing everywhere, so similar to Hawaii. 
but at the same time with the most old school beautiful europe feel you know these cobblestone roads and great vines growing everywhere and delicious wines and and houses made of stones and just the most beautiful people um i went there because i was offered a trip from one of my sponsors, um, Rife International. They make all of my spear fishing gears and you know my spear guns and masks and everything. And they had actually found um, a spear fisherman there named Paulo, Paulo Afonso, and um, and and they noticed what a diamond in the rough this guy was and just how he like catches these incredible fish and how what a great spear fisher he is. And they decided to add him to the team and to sponsor him. And, um, and so then they asked me, Hey, we'd love to do a, a team trip. Would you like to go meet Paulo in the Azores? And as soon as they said that, I mean, I did not even hesitate. I cleared my schedule and I just said, yes, I'm going there. And honestly, it wasn't about meeting Paulo. <laughs> it wasn't about spearfishing. It wasn't about any of the reasons why they were signing me up for this trip. I was going for Connie. Um, but when I got there, I just, oh my gosh, the gift that I got in meeting this beautiful man and his beautiful family and the way that he lived his life, it, it's such a trip because you know I got to go, not only go spearfishing, but I just got to do so many things that Connie and I like to do. You know, one of the things she liked to do was, was picking, she wasn't a spearfisher, but she'd always peg along with me when I would go because she wanted me to be safe. And one of her favorite things to do was to pick these shellfish, um, these limpets, these limpets that we call opihi in Hawaii. And she loved picking opihi and she loved eating them. And in fact, that was the last meal that we had had together. And that was the absolute first thing that Paulo had for us to do is we got in the ocean and it's called lapas over there. And we picked these lapas and brought them home to his beautiful family and grilled them up with some fish and, you know, harvested all these fruit and vegetables and made these wonderful meals. And, um, and it was just, it was just such a beautiful time. I spent 10 days there um, with hardly any time on my cell phone, no time doing the, the normal work and social media that I do. And instead just gave myself to being absolutely present in the moment. And it had felt like I had gone back in time. Um, and every part of it, I felt connecting me to Tani on a higher level. And also the, you know, amazing thing is the friend that I made in Paulo, like we, we just said it to each other the other day where we're like, gosh, it feels like we've been friends our whole life, but we just finally got to meet, you know? And, and so it's really interesting that she truly led me to somebody, um, that that we understand each other and it, it's like really fulfills something in us, you know, because he lives, you know, pretty isolated, very, very far away. And, uh, and so it was, it was not taken lightly. It was very special to both of us that, um, that we were able to meet and spend all this time together and take away so much from it. And so we're already planning our next trip together. <laughs> you, you've had an amazing career and it sounds like these things just sort of, come when they're meant to come into your life. You've made a lot of conscious decisions. It sounds like to accept things, um, but also to turn things down that might bring you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So like when the, the shark picture it's happened, true. it sounds like you said no right. to some Hollywood tabloid stuff and you kept the footage for yourself. So you seem really calculated when, when it comes towards to your career, I guess my question is, so how do you decide, I know to use a, a spear fishing term, but like, how do you decide to pull that, the trigger that, or no, not? Love, yeah, that, that, that's the perfect analogy. Like, when do you pull a trigger? And I think that, um, that when it comes to the, this magic that we talk about and all these great opportunities that seem to just fall right on my lap, um, I do think that that there, there is um, a lot more calculation in that than even I probably realize. Uh, but I think it definitely has to do with with being ready to say yes when you mean it. And like like I say, like this trip to the Azores, that was that moment. As soon as I heard, I didn't ask any questions. I, you know, I just knew like this is it, say yes. And there's been, um, you know, a, a few times, in, a lot of times in my life where I just know like, like now's the time, pull trigger, do it now. Um, 
But I do think the harder part of all of that is knowing when to say no. And at least for me personally, I'm not good at saying no. That's, that's a lot, a lot more difficult, a lot more uncomfortable um, than saying yes. And so that was the part that really taught me the most probably. Um, yeah, it's true that when the great white shark footage, you know, started to get out there and leak out there, um, I had I had producers hounding me for it, like literally pressuring me for it. And so, so really, um, I think I had just come to a point where I had started to listen to my inner guidance already, you know, when it comes to, when it came to walking away from competition, when it came to um, believing in the art of storytelling, um, you know, all of these career paths that, you know, that I had made a decision that wasn't the popular decision, you know, I like, like to say walking away from competition, it was not a popular decision. And I was put down a lot for that. And yet, through listening to myself, not only did it work, you know, not only did it lead me somewhere better, but it led me somewhere that wasn't just better, but it was, it was better because it was better for me. It was more truthful to who I really am. So, you know, and I, I honestly do think a lot of it, I learned through spearfishing, um, you know, since you did give the analogy of just like, how do you know when to pull a trigger? Like there, there's been times in my life where my dream fish has swam up to me and for some reason I blew it, you know, I missed the shot or I didn't react the way, you know, I didn't react in time and it swam away. Um, and, or I took a bad shot, which is, you know, even worse. And, um, and I would come home from these days just crying and I would be so sad. And I would just say like, you know, I blew it every single star in the universe lined up to give me that beautiful opportunity, that beautiful fish, you know, that beautiful shot and I blew it and it's never going to happen again. And I'm like, that's how hard I would take it, you know? And one thing the ocean taught me is that it does happen again. That's really amazing insight. And I think it is difficult to say no. Um, I think as women, it's difficult to say no. You're a woman. Oh, definitely. You're a woman in a really male dominated field. I don't know very many female spearfisher women. I have two female friends at spearfish. Um, that's not a lot out of my friends. A lot more of them are guys that are, that are in your field. So two quick questions, just, just any advice to women in male dominated fields and any advice to people who really want to make a career around their passions? Okay, sure. Um, I guess my advice to women in a male dominated field, well, first of all, I do have to say that within the tight knit, um, community of, of free diving, spearfishing, um, I really, I really haven't, I really haven't like had to, I've, I've never felt like discriminated. Oh, I mean, maybe here and there, but I, for the most part, the people that are in this community have treated me not like a woman and not like a man, but simply like a diver. And that has always been all that I ever wanted. I've, I've never, never wanted to be good for a girl. I've never needed to be better than the boys. I just want to be a good diver. And I think that because um, that is my true intention, that's what's really important to me. I think anybody else, you know, of, of any sort of status or whatever, you know, skill in this community, I think that's something they recognize right away. Um, with that being said, I have realized more so in, in terms of career, you know, when it comes to companies and sponsors and jobs and, um, and all that, that it hasn't, hasn't quite been as equal. And, um, and I just remember finally one year getting extremely fed up with that and realizing that one of the sponsors that I was working with like 
all of the work that I was doing, I was obviously a top brand ambassador, you know, products with, with my, with my name on it were selling out and, and I was really, um, not really making a dime. And, um, and then when I looked at, you know, how, how others are being treated, it didn't add up. And, and I started to get extremely resentful and, um, and, and finally, it got to a point where I was so fed up that when when this company asked me to start to start doing, you know, taking on more projects for them, you know, I just started saying no. And um, and so, again, I came with saying no. And, and it got to the point where I started saying no so much where I actually got called in um, to to meet the CEO of the company, which I had who I never had met before. I had been with the company for four years, never had met the CEO and I was called in to meet the CEO of the company, and um, and she just wanted to know, like, you know, why I was no longer interested in taking on these projects. And that was the most uncomfortable feeling for me. Like, I just realized how little of a voice that I had. You know, right now, I'm face-to-face with the CEO of, almost, you know, of, of a multi, multi, multi-million dollar company. Like, it's a great opportunity you know, nobody really gets to gets to be here at her desk and, and state their case. And I could not talk. I just like felt so mute and and I felt embarrassed and and I just like it was ridiculous how little of a voice I had. Um, but she sat there and she just sat there and she just waited and I I cried. It's so weird, you know, like so interesting, but I just started crying and it was really, really uncomfortable. And, um, but slowly, and thanks to her patience, I don't know if all CEOs would be this patient, I finally was able to tell her that I had been working for this company and working my butt off for years and had not ever been compensated fairly for anything that I had ever done. And I, and she, you know, and she listened and I just told her that, I think that deep down inside, I always hoped that if I just kept working hard, that somebody would notice my value. And, and when they noticed my value, that they would then, you know, compensate me for it and, and pay me for it. And, and then when that never happened, it only just made me doubt myself more. And it only made me feel, you know, less valued and less important. And then I started to get almost so insecure to the point where I developed this complex of feeling like I was never enough. And I had lost my voice because of how I was being treated. And, um, and, and so she just said, you know, look, like, um, if you could, you know, if you could just write me up a report of what you've done for us, for the past four years, I would like to learn more about this. And I said, I'll write up what I've done for a year because I think that'll be more than enough for you to read. And, um, and she just said, why do you think it was so hard for you to tell me this? And I, I just said, I don't know. You know, I said, maybe it's my culture. I mean, I grew up in Hawaii. I grew up with, you know, I, I'm part Japanese. I have no idea, you know, but maybe it's part of my culture where, where I, I sometimes get too humble to ask for things and I would rather people see it in me and reward me than for me to have to ask for it. And then she just said, you know, I've been a CEO of companies for most of my life. And she's like, um, I could not even tell you how many men throughout my whole career have asked me for a raise. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a countless number at this point. Like I really could not tell you how many men have asked me for a raise because it happens all the time. And she said, but do you know how many women in my whole career have asked me for a raise? And I said, no, how many? And she's like, you're number six. And, and that, I mean, that just really dawned on me that that just really, you know, woke me up and, and it gave me a voice because it made me realize that that's not right and that's not okay. And it has to change and it has to start with us. And, and although I, you know, I could blame that company, you know, for, for not paying attention or for taking advantage of me for those years or whatnot, you know, which they totally made up for, (laughs) I have to just say like, um, they're still my sponsors. Um, and, 
as soon as I brought everything to their attention, as soon as I turned in that report, I not only got my raise, but I got um, a nice, generous, we're very sorry check. And, um, and I know that not <laughs> all companies are awesome. that good. Yeah, uh, there are, I'll just say it, it is Patagonia. I, I mean, I was just going to tell you, like, Kimmy, like, there's not yeah. many female CEOs in this industry. I'm going to guess who it is. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it was Patagonia. And, and, you know, and they just said to me, I got, I got handwritten letters from, from all of them, from the owner, the Chenard, everyone just saying, we had no idea and we're really sorry. And we'll be the first to say we are so not a perfect company, but we are willing to try and make this up to you. We're willing to, to do what we can to fix our mistakes. And we just hope that we can make you feel better. And, um, and, you know, and, and what I realized from that is that I had become resentful towards them. I had become, you know, I, I, I was blaming them, but I didn't do my part. Cause I never asked, you know, like it's so easy for things to fall through the cracks when there's so many people underneath this big, you know, corporate company constantly trying to do the right thing. But if you don't express yourself, if you don't, um, you know, state your own value, like how's anyone else supposed to notice? Like, and so, so knowing that I was getting so resentful to the point where I was about to walk away from that company and not say anything. I was just saying no to their projects and whatever and, and, and almost just like looking for a way out until I got called into the CEO's office, which was the best opportunity because, and it, and it then still took me a good 15 minutes to get my crap together and, and say one word to her, you know, but, um, but, but the way that they handled it and the way that they treated me and then what Rose said to me about, how I was one of very few women to ever ask for a raise. It just really made me realize that a moment of being uncomfortable to state your truth is so worth the, the moments of regret uh, and resent that would come if you don't. And it is our duty as women to understand that more and not to just you know, sit around or work really hard and hope that somebody validates us. No, like we need to embrace our voice and validate ourselves and ask for what's fair. And if you're with the right company, if you're with the right people, it will work out. And if it doesn't, then move on, girl. (laughs) That's all I'd have to say for women out there. Kimmy, thank you for sharing this story. And um, I, I, I knew it was Patagonia. They're such a great brand. Rose is such a great CEO. They are. And you're right. You have to ask. You don't get anything unless you ask. And if you're a woman, you have to ask and it's uncomfortable. And right now I'm asking for sponsorship for this podcast with big companies and I'm asking for, you know, pretty big commitments. And it's, it's been a really interesting experiment. It's nerve wracking, but also really empowering when you ask and, you know, you get it rejected is. a little, but you receive. So thank you. Yeah. Kimmy, you're well, awesome. So the, that, that meeting, I have to say, was just so weird. It's like another little side note that I didn't mention. Like, while I sat there in the chair and couldn't find my voice and it said started to cry in my seat and just felt like the most awkward girl in the world, um, I also noticed that Rose's office had, like, glass windows and that um, I was afraid of people outside seeing me. And so then I did the next weirdest thing where I just looked at her and I said, I think I can talk now if I switch seats with you because her seat had her, like, more hidden. And I actually asked her and she switched seats with me. And I sat in her chair when I finally started pouring my heart out and crying. And so it was the most weird awkward meeting I had ever had in my life. And yet um, every awkward step, I found one more word of my voice to tell my story. And she was wonderful and patient and caring enough to not only hear it, but deliver that message. If I see something that's going on within a company that, you know, doesn't really match up to our core values, I'll be the first to, to mention it. You know, if I think that something's not quite fair, like I'll be the first to ask for it. Or if I just really want something, I will ask for it. And I get told no, <laughs> you know, here I get told no, um, probably more than I'm told yes. I don't know. I mean, it's not, it may be equally, but, but still it doesn't, that doesn't make it a fail. Like even when I ask and I'm told no, 
um, it's great because at least I'm being heard and at least my concern is being heard. And, and I just know like, okay, well I asked and I said no, you know? And so next time I ask you for something, I hope you're going to say yes. And, and the more that you ask, even when you're being told no, I think the more it sets you up for those good yeses later. Yeah. I think that's great. Okay. So I'm going to do the lightning round questions. So any, okay. any, advice on training if i want to learn to start free diving are there any breath exercises or places books training manuals websites i can go to that might help me get better at holding my breath and diving more comfortably i would say doing yoga and meditation um is a wonderful way to start and if you want to take it a step further and focus specifically on breath holding and free diving, you should sign up for a course. And there's really great courses offered by a company called FII, and um, and they they're all over the world. And you can probably find an instructor near you. Awesome, FII. I will put that in the show notes. Yeah. Morning rituals. Do you have any morning rituals? <laughs> My morning ritual is waking up and um, going through <laughs> my therapeutic uh, process of grinding coffee beans and making coffee. But um, the whole time I'm doing it, I'm also just taking a mental inventory of everything that there is um, in my fridge, in my garden and whatnot. And and I'm trying to already plan out um, how to best use this beautiful food and and wonder um, when the next time will be where I go spearfishing. <laughs> I love that. If you could go back in time and tell your 15-year-old self one piece of advice, what would you tell 15-year-old Kimmy? And the reason I asked 15 is because that was a really vulnerable time for just yeah. boys and girls. You're a sophomore, freshman in high school, and, and you're probably pretty awkward. Yeah, I would tell my 15-year-old self that you can let go of all the anger. And I know that you think that anger is your strength. And you're right that you are extremely strong. You're very strong, but you don't need the anger to prove that. Anger is just a guard. It's just a facade. It's just a, it's just a second emotion that you're using to, because you're too afraid of exposing those really sensitive, vulnerable feelings because they make you feel weak, but they don't make you weak. And the sooner that you can drop that guard and love yourself and and just truthfully, truthfully love yourself and know that you are a vulnerable, sensitive being and that that's not a weakness, it's your strength, the happier you're going to be. Awesome. Must-haves that you take on the road. So travel must-haves. Do you bring like a pillow, eye mask, certain gear my must have that i take on the road i take um, a utensil set that um my, my company actually makes it's called keepwildco.com and we sell utensil kits because when i'm on the road i just have such a oversupply of single use plastic coming at me from all angles and it it just drives me crazy how much plastic can be used and so um so yeah so we developed this this really chic leather case with a uh, fair trade organic napkin and um and and real utensils straws forks and spoons and i bring that in my purse with me wherever i go so that i can turn down single-use plastic um that and i bring my yeti water bottle so i don't have to take plastic water bottles and i can keep my my water cold and great um and i i always bring a natural sunblock wherever i go lately i've been using the brand called abasol um, it doesn't hurt our oceans the way that other sunblocks do. And um, it's just really important for me to have that on me at all times. And I take a little a little pocket journal to write down some thoughts. That's also um, something that, that we sell on Keep Wild. But, yeah, we, we sell a lot of travel. It didn't make me to be such a pitch, but we sell a lot of travel essentials since I travel so much. <laughs> Wait, this is awesome. So I actually travel with pretty much all the same things you do. And I have a waterproof mini oh. notebook, so you can actually take it diving. Oh, I will nice. hook you up with this notebook company, so they sponsor you. Um, yes. What's Keep Wild? So, um, 
Our website is keepwildco.com and Keep Wild is this lifestyle brand that I developed with my friend Akemi and my wonderful assistant Sarah. And the whole concept of it was just to create a brand um, making really nice quality things that you know that we said are they're for the professional nomad. They're they're for somebody who wants to stay on top of their game, but it's also very portable and moving around a lot. And we really wanted it to be a focus and sustainable products so all of our leather is like eco tan like i said our napkin is fair trade certified we have um a lot of little wooden um wooden things for homeware that are made out of salvaged wood or or made from the branch of a tree that's still living and um really just kind of form this community of local artists and woodworkers and leather workers and um and made quality products that that we feel that we like to have in our life, um, but we want them to be more responsible. And originally the brand was going to be um, called, you know, they wanted to be called the Kimmy Warner Collection. And they designed this beautiful logo with a K and a W and, um, you know, a little spear on it. But um, I just kind of felt a little narcissistic having my name be the name of it. So I said, you know, can we find something else to match that K and W? And can we change the brand name? I said that very last minute. And uh, and then I, I, I really thought about the concept of what we're trying to do and the concept of how I live my life, you know, the concept of, how, of the food that I choose to eat. And it just dawned on me that the KW stands for Keep Wild. I yeah. love it. I mean, obviously, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, wild ideas worth living, keep wild. There's there's a lot of synergy there. Right? That is very cool. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, if you could throw a party, any party right now, like like right now, mine, I don't know, I keep saying this, but it's like a cross between a, a like a crazy bat mitzvah and quinceanera, but like with really good Mexican food on an island and you surf and then Kelly <laughs> Slater's wave pool is there, but it's also like a natural wave, so... You can do both. Um, and there's good music and we go to bed early because I'm a morning person. Um, what's your party? Right. What party are you throwing? Oh, gosh, that's such a good one. And now that you said yours, I'm like, ooh, that, I might have to step up my game. Um, I would have a party that would have a bunch of my closest friends and really, really big, cool bugs everywhere, like, Great Danes and Rottweilers and um, and just really friendly, mellow but beautiful big dogs. Um, dog friendly party and and cute babies that the friends can bring. Just cute, well behaved, smiley babies and um, and then just a whole bunch of different food stations from all of my favorite places that I've been to in the world. Cooking my favorite dish that I ate there probably all taking place within this big garden and then um and then a little outdoor screen set up so that we could watch a really great enlightening um film under the stars i love that i'm coming to that party <laughs> okay books yeah i think i'll do it books or any videos that you you love watching or giving um books I mean, I haven't read it in forever, but, but definitely The Alchemist was a big one for me when I was younger. Four Agreements is something that I can, you know, reread and it can help keep me in check. Um, anything written by Brene Brown, I just absolutely love. I just think um, the research she does on vulnerability is amazing. Um, I did recently finish Susan Casey's Voices of the Ocean, um, an extremely, extremely good book about about dolphins um in the world today and um and as far as as videos that i've watched i would say that elizabeth gilbert's ted talk on the creative genius is one of my all-time favorites oh that's my favorite and she talks about magic yeah <laughs> yep, exactly coconuts or avocado so hard avocado that's my call too, but it's like so hard. If you're stranded on an island, though, so would hard. you change your mind? Would you I do just coconuts? Mix them together. Um, <laughs> no. Okay. I bro- think I'd still go avo. Okay. Favorite fish to catch right now, today. Mu. What's mu? Hawaiian fish. M U. M U. Um. Sorry. Yeah. Just M U. 
And it's a Hawaiian emperor fish. They're very elusive, very, very hard to hunt. You know, there's a lot of them, but they're just, they're smart fish and they know how to stay out of range. And they seem to almost like levitate instead of swim. They're like in the matrix. But um, they eat sea urchins and crustaceans and they're just such delicious fish. They're the only fish that I know of here that has actual molars. Like they have human teeth. It's kind of weird looking, but, um, but they're just, they're just fascinating and delicious in every which way. You know, how do you know when to ask for help? It seems like you have a great team around you. You even have an assistant. Like, how did you do that and get to the point where you asked for help to build your your Kimmy Warner brand and empire and to do what you do? I think asking for help is something that has been hard for me. And, um, and it, it takes a lot of courage, but I think if you believe in something enough um, and you really want to see something grow, uh, it, you you can't do it alone. I don't think that's how we're designed. I think that we we are designed to have tribes, and and to me, a tribe is what makes you so much stronger, and it gives so much more meaning to your work. And the only way that you can form a a tribe and actually grow in that direction is to ask for help. And, and, you know, and it's not going to be just asking anyone. It it has to be, you know, the right person and whatnot. But I do think that if you put that on your radar and you know that that's what you want, um, you can find the courage to do it. But trying to do everything on your own, things will plateau, things will get messy. And what I found personally is things will have less meaning. The minute that I hired my personal assistant, Sarah, I mean, not only did she truthfully help me, you know, grow my business, but I helped myself 10 times more than I was helping myself earlier because all of a sudden it wasn't about just me anymore. You know, all of a sudden I wasn't just waking up and trying to find a way to, to make success for myself because I can get by on very little, <laughs> you know, I can really get by on little and still be happy. But the minute she was on the team and I realized this person is here to help me, they're, they're, they're taking a chance with me. They're in, you know, investing their time in me. Like she's on my boat too. I'm going to steer this boat with a lot more, you know, a, a lot more drive than I was before because I got some precious cargo on it. And, um, and so it really does help to have another person helping you because, um, for me, at least it adds that much more meaning to the work that I do. Oh, that's so helpful in such a, such a timely answer. Last question, cause we didn't really totally get to this, um, advice, you'd give to others who want to live more wildly and make a career around their passions? I would just say always somehow create the time to do whatever it is that makes you feel like, like you're, you're, you're following your calling to do whatever it is that, you know, that whatever activity it is and, you know, that, that makes you feel the most you. And it doesn't matter if it's something that the rest of society casts aside as a hobby or unimportant or, you know, not a good use of your time. If it makes you feel truly happy and connected to yourself, make the time to do it. And as you do that, you will feel bliss and you just have to follow that. And, and it's going to be different for everyone on on how to, but as long as you keep following that curiosity and following that passion and you always, you know, you never take that light off of it, um, a path will emerge. And just remember that you don't have to see how you're going to get there in the long run. You just have to see the next step and just keep taking that next step. And um, it's just like driving at night, you know, when you have your headlights on, you can't see your final destination, but you can see the next 20 feet in front of you. And that's all you need to see. And if you just drive that, you'll see the next 20 feet and you'll see the next. And just remember that and keep following it. I love that advice. Kimmy, thank you so much for coming <laughs> yeah. on Wild Ideas Worth Living and sharing your ideas. You're such an inspiration Thanks and so much, Shelby. such a force. 
what an awesome human. Please do not try any of those things like grabbing dorsal fins of sharks at home. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Kimmy for sharing so gracefully and boldly your story. I'm super pumped. I hope you listening, wherever you are, are also excited. Thank you for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. And whoever these hilarious pseudonyms writing awesome reviews telling me how much you love my podcast on iTunes, thank you. There's a meanie face, Kate Rocks. I think I saw something like Shark Slayer. I love these reviews on iTunes. Keep them coming, especially the five-star ones. Actually, all my reviews have been awesome, so thank you. These actually help the show grow. So my ask for you today is whoever's next to you right now, just smile at them. Give someone a hug. The world never gets tired of hugs and smiles. Thank you again for listening. Thank you to Traeger Grills and to Olukai Sandals for supporting this show. These companies rock. They do good. They make awesome products. Check them out. And wherever you are listening, don't forget, some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest idea. We'll see you next week. Have an amazing day. 